Yeah. Let's make a re- yeah, let's make a requirement that when people log in, you have to have your camera on until uh, oh, yeah. you get started. It, it, it's your session, so up to you. <laughs> Go for <laughs> it. If I have my camera on, you people have to have your camera on too. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so we will keep the air so that like all of us are visible. Yeah, point it so that you got, come on, make it look like there's a lot of people here. Hey, just like in the old days. I like that. Very good. You can stand there with them as you speak. Uh, other people, guys, come on. Yeah, yeah. Those of you who are logged in. Oh, thank you, Christian. How are you? Thanks, I'm fine. Falling asleep. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What time is it in Portugal? 11 p.m. Oh, that's early. But I'm still at the university, so it's okay. Okay. All right. Good. Hey, we got people from other places. So I'm in California. I know Chris is in Portugal. We got the crowd in New Zealand. Anybody else from anything different? Virginia. Virginia. Wow. Yes. Oh, that's like close to Trump, isn't it? (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) That's okay. They're all among us. Don't worry. Oh, I should look over here. I've got two computers. So the other computer, I see more of the people. Uh, Kevin, where are you from? Um, I'm from Taiwan, but I'm now in Seattle. Oh, I like Seattle. <laughs> Travis. Yeah, there's, there's a few of us here from Seattle. Oh, good. I have really good friends in Seattle. All my best friends are up in uh, UW. So I thought I'd be different and not go up there. That's a thing to do. Um, other people, Brian. Oh, look at you. Nice background, Brian. Where are you at? Hello. I am at Oregon at Corvallis. Who is you? Yeah, but I am originally from Ecuador. Oh, you guys have good earthquakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We Very do. nice. <laughs> good. Peter, are you from the West or from the East? Peter West. <laughs> uh, I'm from Pakatani, New Zealand. They have plenty. Oh, very nice. Mm. Guess that's either north or south, huh? In the North Island on the East Coast. Oh, cool. It's, well, um, I, it's a really nice place to be. I think I've been there. Is it a, across the way from Auckland? Like you go, I've been to like, uh, you go due west from Auckland. I've been there. Oh, we're about three hours drive. Okay. Very nice. Far away. Oh, good. Uh, who else you got? We got people who don't have their cameras on. Hey, what about in the crowd? What do we have over there? You guys want to shout out your names? Mohammed. I'm Pawan. This is Mohammed. I'm from China. Oh, you guys froze. All right, you guys down down under froze in the big room. Okay, how many people we have? About 16. Pavan, you guys froze. We I lost you guys. Ooh, I like somebody here. His name Uzo. It's not a good um, Greek or Turkish. Um, um, Turkish no, it, it's actually Nigerian. I'm from Nigeria. Oh, yeah. I got you out, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Hello, and you're calling from Nigeria? Oh, no, I'm in Seattle. Oh, you're one yeah. of them Seattlers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> go, go Seattle Packers, right? Um, who else is on... Uh, that wants to say hi. I guess we've got everybody. Okay. So we got 17 people on right now. Pavan, do you wanna get started or it's your show? I'm just a guest here.
Sorry, I didn't realize you're on mute. Uh, we are missing some regulars, but we'll start. No, no worries. So, hello everyone. Thank you for. Uh, I'll come into the front and do it <laughs> since the camera is reversed. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming uh, and attending the session online and in person. Uh, today we have Sylvia, uh, Dr. Sylvia Madzani uh, from US. Uh, she's a lecturer and research scientist uh, at UCLA. And if you are already an OpenSys user, you know her. And if you are about to uh, start, then you'll know her. So <laughs> you can't miss her if you're in this. So I'll not talk too much about her and I'll give her the chance to start the session. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, most of you guys have seen my name on top of your script. Um, oftentimes, I love it when people ask me questions about a script and they send it to me and it's got my name on it. So, or I can uh, kind of tell my style of scripting from others. So I'm, I'm always thrilled to see my script because it means that you're starting at a good place and you've been handed down something good. So, hi, I'm Sylvia Mazzoni. I'm not going to spend too much time on who I am. I'd rather talk about what I do. Um, and so I'm going to kind of take you on a little journey today, I think is, uh, is the plan. Let me uh, share my screen. There's two things that I wanted to go through with you guys is one to kind of introduce to you my new initiative, uh, something that I kind of just got into at early April. Honestly, it was planned for a year before COVID already. Um, and just the timing with COVID um, kind of, I don't know if it worked to my advantage or not, definitely not in so many other levels. Um, so I started a new project uh, looking at uh, that I, with time I called Sylvia's Brainery, which is really just a place to collect um, all the different things that I do and kind of want to start my own quote unquote consulting. What I wanna do in the presentation is kind of almost go backwards just because the history is really the part that I wanna discuss with you guys. So I'm gonna give you some highlights about Sylvia's Brainery, what it's about and what it is that I'm building. Then I wanna give you some demonstration of Easy's, the software that I developed, but not really, I don't really wanna do a dog and pony show except for the fact that I wanna show you how awesome it is, um, but really why it's awesome and, and just thinking about what I was thinking about in designing this user interface. Um, and then afterwards, I figured the discussion with you guys is to talk about what I've done, uh, how I built this, how I came up with this, and just the process that I'm in the process of right now. Because the goal for me of today is not to really sell you anything as much as that I'm not going to pretend that I'm not, um, but really to kind of show you what I've done and, and give you ideas and things that I've considered in what I'm building. And, and so something for you guys to think about as you develop your own scripts or your own things that you do um, with open seas and as you grow as engineers and the different applications, and, you know, nowadays everybody's got a little bit of an entrepreneurial mind, which I think is great because if everybody can create, instead of having one person create something big by themselves. Um, if everybody just works together and uh, share ideas and share the process, I think especially that kind of goes along with what Open Seas is trying to do. Um, so that's kind of where I want to talk about the ideas, the, the things that I've already gone through so that then you don't, you can hopefully learn from that and um, make your own type of mistakes or different choices. Okay, so I'm gonna start up this presentation and uh, pretty much, you know, you can visit my website and see these things that I'm going to show you. And there's a lot more to it. So I kind of want to just give you highlights of my project. I, I don't want to, um, but in 2010, I left Open Seas and I've been working on completely different things. And I almost feel like I left something unsaid. And now that the technology has caught up and and I have access to more things. I'm kind of going back to it because I feel like I still have a lot to share in my understanding and knowledge uh, with what I do with Open Seas and the things that I've created, I, I think can really help 
um, people out there. So that's pretty much the foundation of, you know, my brainery. A brainery is not about a brain. It's really just about a collection. It's an academy that is just a collection of bits and pieces from different people. My goal is not to just be about me, um, but to really build a community, which is already there. I had to put my name on there because that's my brand. That's how people recognize me is by my name. I know it's strange and it's kind of cool. Um, but so that's why the name is there just because it draws attention. Uh, people associated with open seas right away and things like that. So it's really hard for me to, to use my name on there because I've never really been about myself. Um, but it just, that was the brand, that's my brand. And, and so I had to associate that with there. And so that's the, again, as I go through here, just the thinking of things that you want to think about, uh, you know, what, what, what am I known for and how am I known sometimes are two different things that you have to take into account. Um, I've done, you know, I, anytime there's a program or something that needs to be done, I always go in and, and write a program about it. So I've developed a lot of different software tools. My open seas one is not my only one. If anybody, any one of you guys have, has uh, used the peer ground motion database online to get ground motions for your analyses, I built that uh, user interface that's online. I'm now working on a couple of other ones for the university. So I always think of you know doing things efficiently, mainly because um, I like to keep the human factor out of it because that's where we make mistakes. So I try to automate automate as many things as possible, and also just be intuitive in it. Um, my website and my services, I, I hit three different things. One is consulting. I often get called in for maybe just ground motion selection work uh, or, you know, I'm hired to develop some um, uh, elements for open seas. Uh, courses, you know, you've, you've seen my courses online, but uh, it's kind of fun. We're doing a lot of, we, we're doing this open seas cafe. A couple of you guys out there are in the cafe and really just building conversations. We've had, I've had students just set up a one-on-one -on -one with me or with Michael Scott to just kind of, you know, get some answers, um, some questions answered. And then the products is, is my apps. I also want to start anyways. Okay. Um, and I always have so many ideas. So I'm kind of excited to have built this platform that allows me to just add in little things and, and kind of improve them as I go along. As I said, um, I've built the Academy or Sylvia's Brainery, uh, these courses and online training. But my goal is not just, you know, what's on the YouTube and these, you know, just pre-recorded um, courses. A lot of it is, um, you know, as I said, open one-on-one -on -one training uh, sessions. I have a company, there's a company that just hired me to develop a training program for them. So part of it is the videos, but then part of it is, you know, live sessions. So those are the different aspects of trying to, you know, it's not just something that's static but really build something a little bit more interactive than that, which I really like. And then I, that's how I ran into this group um, just on YouTube. And I really like the idea of this open sea support group, which to me is kind of, you know, <laughs> it's kind of nice because it's like, okay, like we're all going through the same. It really means a lot because it's like, we're all going through the same struggles. And so let's learn from each other. So I, I like how you build this community like this. Um, and, and so thank you so much for inviting me to, to present here and participate. Um, and so this is what you will see on the website. Um, as I said, there's the courses online and this was, I wanna talk about how this was driven afterwards when, you know, just talk about why I left YouTube. Um, I'm no longer a YouTube star, but uh, that's okay. Uh, and uh, why I had to build this infrastructure. But there's courses and what's really cool is I started with just my own uh, videos, but there's actually um, a fellow from, and, I, and I'll show you his picture afterwards, uh, but there's other people that have actually contributed courses here. So for example, I know nothing of CSI, but I found someone who had built this beautiful course about performance-based design and uh, perform. And so he actually contributed the course to um, to the group and we share the, you know, the, uh, the little bit of money that we can make out of it. So it's kind of cool. It's nice to have people contributing and uh, this community growing. 
These are the three instructors that we are right now, as I told you. So I've got Haitham Abdelmalek. He's actually in Cairo, Egypt. We have never met in person, uh, but I just saw his course when he advertised it and I actually bought his course. He was selling it on Udemy and he did such a great job. I love his graphics and, and he taught me to put little music and in the videos. So um, he has a great teaching style and that's where he came in and uh, joined the team. And then the rest of you, if you don't know me, you must know Michael Scott. He is a professor in Oregon. He and I went to school together in Berkeley and he's actually one of the real main developers of open seas. If you're using the beam with hinges, he developed that and he actually is the one who extended the nonlinear beam column element. So he's my deep technical guy. If somebody needs help uh, with, uh, with development in open seas, he's actually the person that people would meet with. You need to so ask him also for a presentation sometime. Maybe. Yeah, he was kind of upset that you invited his postdoc, but not him. No, no, no. <laughs> so, so the thing is, uh, I talked to Zoo before, like for, because I posted some examples and stuff. So I know him like, and to approach Michael, Dr. Michael, uh, the thing is, this is like the exams time and stuff, right? So I, I thought like know. I, will, I'm I just will email just... him. It's not like, and there was like, okay, first let me see how people are responding to this. And maybe after coming in January, I'll ask him that way it's a good start. Okay. All right. Well, he's waiting for an email. Oh, from wait. You. I am sending it today then. <laughs> okay. I don't know. He was going to try to come in here and uh, and say something, but uh, oh, no, he, he's waiting for I mean, an invitation. That's, so, I mean, um, good to know that he is waiting, but like, sorry yeah. to disappoint him online. Oh, that's all right. Uh, that's all right. Uh, no, I mean, and, and it's, it's neat because he's as enthusiastic about, you know, he has a day job, so he's not trying to make any, you know, big money from this, but you know, it, it's like, you guys know what it's like. Once you've discovered this and you figured out how open seas work works, um, it's kind of fun to, to share with others. And there's always things to learn from other tricks that other people do. So like, for example, I'll show you the, the open seas cafe. It's neat because I'm learning stuff I didn't even know uh, and how different people use uh, the program differently. So it just becomes like a common language. And I mean, open seas is just a tool to do the research that we wanna do. Um, so it's a great way of just kind of learning so much about structural engineering and different research applications and real applications too. Um, so that's why I'm in it to really just learn more and be able to share what I do. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's real. Um, and that's why I'm trying to make it financially sustainable so I can do this. Um, these are just a list and I'm going to come back afterwards and, and talk with you guys about these different things. And I want to kind of go through them. But for me, it was key to, I have ADHD. I am the ultimate person with ADHD. I cannot do one single thing. I have to have 17 things going on at the same time. And I will not finish a single one of them. Uh, so, which is good for this endeavor. Uh, it's terrible if you want to have a life in academia um, and, or like a real job or anything like that, but that's okay. I've, I've reached 50 years old and haven't had a real job and people are still paying me to learn. So I'm going to just keep at it for as long as I can. I just have to adapt and come up with new things. So this is the new project. Um, so I'm kind of building this. It's really, again, as I said, the focus is community building and engagement. So I'm, I'm throwing this to you guys because I want this to become a two-way conversation. I like this group, how it's something that can grow. Uh, but I would love to, you know, if, if there's people, there's somebody, it, it was interesting because Alex Baker, he, uh, he wanted to develop some courses uh, because he's got something to share, but he's really busy with his courses right now. But he shared a script that he has developed that I posted online. So everybody's got, you know, it's kind of fun to, everybody can contribute different things. And my job is to just bring it all together. You know, I've got almost a thousand followers. Uh, my kids are impressed. My kids, fr I have two daughters who are teenagers. They're uh, almost 17 and 19 years old. So I have more subscribers than some of their friends. And so they're kind of proud of that. Um, but I have a voice and, and I have the brand recognition as, as Pavan mentioned. And so my job is to, hey, you know, to really bring attention to what others are doing and, and make it, there, there's plenty of room 
at, uh, I'm not at the top, um, but wherever it is that I am, there's plenty of room for me to, to use my voice as a channel for any of you guys, you know, anybody who's got some interesting ideas or things that you want to do. Um, I'm not here to monetize them. I'm here to just give you, you know, an opportunity and a platform. It's a pain to build a website. It's a pain to do a lot of other things. And so I've got an infrastructure there for people to, uh, to collaborate um, and do what you want. So I've got some online courses, as I said, and I'm just relisting, but um, the one-on-one -on -one sessions are a big hit. It's kind of fun because sometimes in one hour, you can you know, save a heck of a lot of time. And uh, we're trying to price it right. If I give it away for free, then people don't value it. Um, and so I've had to quote unquote charge. Plus I'm trying to make this sustainable. Um, but it's interesting because then somebody sent me an email that they wanted to meet with me, you know, for eight weeks, three times a week and to go through it. And I'm like, well, why don't you do the online course first? And so he actually signed up for the online course and maybe for a hundred, hundred fifty dollars it saves him a heck of a lot of money in having, instead of meeting one-on-one. -on -one. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can do these different things. Uh, this open sea support group, I'm, I'm excited to present today, but it's not something that I wanna, I'd like to be part of and, and see where we can take it. I've got my YouTube channel, which is what made me famous. And I, I'd be happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, I'm building a script library, app development, a community forum. I've got, you know, I'm starting little surveys to collect some data about materials and this and that. I think it'd be kind of fun to see what people are doing. I'm uh, bringing back to life Open Seas Days, but trying to go global now since everybody's everywhere. And then I'd like to go, you know, beyond Open Seas and really just build an earthquake engineering or an engineering community. So those are just the little, you know, topics that I kind of like, like to distribute my time on. Of course, you know, my little passion right now is my EZs, which is the OpenSeas user interface, which I want to show you right now and um, kind of just give you some highlights. And again, I don't want to do a dog and pony show, but I wanted to show what I was thinking when I built this user interface because, you know, 10% of your code is the actual code. 90% is the debugging or making it user-friendly and things like that. Um, and so hopefully those are lessons that I've learned or my, my approach to it is a little bit different from other user interfaces or graphical user interfaces. So I'm gonna switch over presentation and I have a presentation that's 84 slides. No, that's 14. Okay, where's my... Uh, 84 slide presentations right there. Ah, there you are. Okay. I'm not going to go through 84 slides. It's just easier for me to just not butcher um, my slide deck. Uh, and uh, so introduce you to what open, what easy is. It took me a while to come up with that name. I'm not so sure about it, but I want it to sound easy. And uh, no, the letters don't really stand for anything other than how it sounds. I think it's system for earthquake engineering simulation. So it's like easy system of, for uh, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, it just, I like the sound of it and the aesthetics of it. So the key of it is what I wanted to do is I didn't want to re I'm a big fan of scripts. I think the user interface for open seas, the scripting user interface is the best, the most powerful and most versatile. Um, but it's not the most user-friendly, let's say, or some people have some prejudices against it. But I didn't want to build a graphical user interface and leave out the opportunities that you have with scripting. My so goal... Script, sorry, the scripting yeah. is in Tickle or in Python? It's going to be our both. So right now is in Tickle because I think Tickle is better than Python. Uh, um, no, no way. But... Oh my gosh, don't even get me. So that's a whole other session. We can have a whole other session on that one. So I'm from the old days of Tickle. I, uh, in my days, Python was not quite fashionable until the Stanford folks made it fashionable. Um, I know Python. I've had, I, I do a lot of programming in Python. I just haven't, you know, this is where I started. I started this program about 10 some years ago. And so I, the... I, I, what I'm thinking of is integrating 
uh, Python commands. Tickle and Python are interchangeable. I like the TK graphic part of it, all the little menus and pull down menus and Python actually uses TK. So that's a whole other thing. So right now it's in Tickle TK, but you could write Python code that will write the input for it. Um, so I have to figure out now an interface for this interface. Um, but let me show it to you because it's really just about developing a new language. And so then it's just the semantics. I mean, I can just write this command could be coming whether it's in Python or it's in Tickle, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, but right now it's in Tickle because I like Tickle and, uh, and mainly because that's where this started. Um, the point of it for me is I wanted to, one is maintain the flexibility of the scripting as well as, um, and there's just a long list here. What I wanted to do is, okay, here's the drawings. Here's, you know, the actual quantities. I don't wanna have to look up, since I wrote the manual for OpenSeas, well, I really just translated one. I, I made the first online one. Um, it's a pain, the semantics of it are a pain. And so I really wanted to build something that was above it. And, you know, what is that F3, 4, F pi of the pinching four model? Um, that question came up the other day and I really have no idea. And oftentimes you take default values for that. So I really wanted something that was minimal input for the user, but I didn't want to hide the input. So I'm going to show you what I actually did. Um, and uh, this slide, I think I have everything on here. And also the ability to run OpenSeas real time in integrating it as part of it. Um, there's... Here's just an example, for example, that I even brought units in. I don't know if you guys, um, I brought units into OpenC scripts a long time ago with that little script that defines units because units are just variables anyways. I learned that from using MathCAD. Um, and this is really just to show you what I like about the TK interface, the, just the little windows and widgets that are available in TK. So that was really important. As much as you can go to Jupyter Notebooks and things like that these days, I wrote a Jupyter Notebook for the ground motion selection for the uh, for Skek, and it just doesn't have the sophistication that uh, these widgets have. Um, so I, I kind of, I like this part of that it's associated with Tickle TK. Uh, and yes, you have to write the scripts yourself, but um, so here's a, the perfect example of my goal with writing this user interface. So Easy's is not a GUI, it's a UI. Uh, GUIs are so 90s, right? Um, UIs are really the way to go now where you can write a script or you can deal with the graphical user interface and they interchange the two. And I'm gonna show you a slide later, but whatever you input in the graphic component, it then saves it into what I see here. This is Easy's language. It's a whole other kind of high level, higher level language above that language of saying, okay, add some material data where you've got a name, you've got a type, and then all I care for is 4,000 PSI. I don't know what, and it's confined to concrete. I, I don't know what all the other parameters that um, OpenSeas has. And the point of it was also that this is actually something that you can translate into a different language as well. And so just like this program writes OpenSeas code, it, the input file in OpenSeas the TK version, I can just have a translator and have these data be translated into uh, the Python because that's just you know a line that I tell my program what the input file is or the input command is. But I really wanted to keep the user away from the input command and to say, okay, 4,000 PSI concrete. And then all these other little values here are optional. So the nice thing about the GUI is that you can visualize what those options are, but you don't have to touch them. So there's definitely a lot of advantages to dealing with the graphical user interface. But as you can say, I'm not defining points and maybe you know the material doesn't even have F prime C as the main input, it may have derived values. And so that's really what I wanted to do in what I had in mind when I kind of came up with, the, with a, a layer on top of the scripting layer uh, so that it, can, it knows what the format is in OpenSeas but the user doesn't have to know about it. Um, it's what I like about, and so there's, a, this is just a quick little outline. And, and what I can do is I can, 
publish uh, this presentation so people can actually get a little bit more details into it. Uh, the scripting, as I said, it's wonderful because you can take advantage, whether it's Python or Tickle, you don't want to lose having a programmable user input. Um, and then the graphical user interface is handy because you can visualize your input and you can run uh, OpenSea's real time. I wanted, here's an example, for example, of um, a for each statement in Tickle. And look at this, I tabulate anyways, just like you would have in Python. And I get to know where my uh, script ends, my loop ends. In Python, I put ends anyways, just because it frustrates me that you don't have to end something. Um, so anyways, so here's kind of the format. It's got menus. It's, I think it's kind of cool. Um, but what's really nice is uh, the is user interface for looking in materials. And it can actually help you to build a, an element or a material and really test out what is the effect of the different parameters. Um, there's, it's broken down, as I was saying before, into required arguments and then optional arguments. So you see, I've put in 57 root f prime c uh, for the e sub c, which then for concrete or two, you actually have to compute something else. And so this kind of does all those input parameters for you. Um, these are just, it's just a list of features. What's nice is the model input is defined as you define elevations and then you define a grid and then you take those elevations and you place them on the grid. And so this is how you define a 3D frame. There are no nodes of no number of one, you know, this are the local coordinates. Of course, right now it's based on Cartesian coordinates. So you have to have some sort of regularity, but you see you define a geometry, you know, the floor heights, uh, bay widths, and it could be different for different bays. And then in the background, I go in and I compute the node numbers. And then I go in and generate an OpenSea's input file. And so I go through this process for materials. Uh, and I think I have most of popular uh, materials. I'm always, I, I've laid things out where I can just add another material if I want. I've got some templates for fiber sections. So it's really cool because you can in real time give the, the size of the rebar and the number and you can test your moment curvature. So I've got templates for those. Um, here's an example of, so for example, you've got minimal input where you just pull out, you know, pull down what are the materials that you have. And then there's additional default parameters as well to just make it that much more interesting. Uh, so you can really look at, you know, different behaviors and different cross sections, and you can really have a lot of fun with it. So it's nice because you can compute, mo you can do some moment curvature analysis. You could just this program just for that if you want to. Um, and then uh, just as you have it in graphics, well, here's how that input would be. So I've shown you a material. This is how it would be for a cross section in reinforced concrete section. Uh, or even uh, do the same thing even for element types. And so I'm gonna just kind of fly through here. Oh, and then, oh good, I did fly through those parts. Um, then there's the building the 3D model. So here's how you use the interface to define your elevations. Uh, and as you can see, there's nice click on or you know quick menus. There's a lot more menus now than when I had then, or you can write that in a script. If you do it graphically, it's gonna write it to a script. If you do the script, it's gonna load it up graphically. Uh, there's lots of different types of elements. You can interactively change. And this is just to kind of walk you through all the little menu options that you have. A lot of these things have changed as well. And what's really cool is uh, gravity loads. You can define gravity loads and then I convert those into loads and masses directly, you don't have to do it, or you can do nodal masses and nodal forces uh, that are just uncoupled if you want to. So, you know, it does that whole computing of the mass uh, for you. It also computes, you know, the equivalent mass at the nodes. So it's just an interface that and I'm just literally, it's kind of cool because then you just click on, you pick an elevation and you click it on the grid and it appears on the right hand side. So there's a lot of programming that went on behind it to really minimize how much work you as a user need to do. Um, the less of a human interface there is or interaction there, the 
more repeatable and less likely we are to you know make mistakes but also just feeds up oh what if i have variations on this um you know it's kind of fun to be able to visualize this frame here is actually defined using these scripts um and so and then there's a whole you know a lot more features and then even in the post processing it's kind of cool to visualize oh then it's got loads and load combinations that are defined. And then this, uh, you can actually run the OpenSea's real time. And if you want, you can visualize, you know, you've seen these scripts, they're in the examples manual, I implemented them to be able to visualize the analyses in real time. Uh, and then you can visualize the results, typical things of results, the color, the element, um, and look at the node responses. And actually it's kind of cool, you can visualize bending moment diagrams, cross sections, and then only select certain things. Oh, look at that. Um, I wanted to show you, oh, you can look at the history, but then you can actually get all the way to the fibers, uh, what the fiber stress strain history is. And um, this one's a little tricky because this is actually not done. So the problem that I have is you don't wanna have all these recorders during the analysis, uh, but I've gone in and spent the time on it. It's like, wait a minute, if I have certain output, I can recreate this. And so you can go down to your stresses and strains without having to store those during the analysis. So that makes the analysis a lot faster and you don't have to store so much data. Um, and so that's pretty much, I, I, again, I, I think it's wonderful. I think everybody should be using it, but I wanted to kind of show you a different way of approaching a user interface where it's not just graphics and just looking at your model, but really kind of redefining uh, it's almost more of a BIM type of uh, system. So that's the little dog and pony show. Any questions on that before I switch back to more starting really a conversation where I have uh, bullet items with you guys? Yeah. Uh, how are you solving the convergence issues when you are making complex models? Because they do have, when you're using uh, certain materials, certain combinations, for example, in a commercial software, you uh, most of the time you don't have any issue and it will give you a result. And how is it with this one? So it's twofold. Uh, yeah, the commercial programs hide it and, and they put in a lot of numerical damping so that you don't have convergence issues. So what I have done is it's the script, the classical script of convergence. Um, and I wish, oh, I, I thought I had it here. Let me show you. Um, just a classic script of, you know, if it doesn't converge, take this step. And, and it does just the, the usual algorithm that I developed with Frank that's in the examples manual. That's going to work 90% of the time. If your model has convergence problem, 97.5% of the time, you should go back and check your model. Yeah. Okay. And so... If you if it can't if it can't get past my script, um, there's something not very likely. It's really with your model, and that's kind of the point of Easy's. Also, it was like go back and check, and everybody was fine. Well, if your cross section is made of pure concrete, it's just it's not going to go very far. You are going to have problems. It, it just it's telling you, hey, there there's some if the response in your cross section is impacting the overall convergence of your system and you don't have load redistribution, then you know you really need to go back and look at your model and look at your sections or really look at, at your buildings and, and those convergence issues are there. Now, the second part is this actually generates an OpenSea's input file. And so um, if I could find it. There it is, there's my demo. So, oh, I, I may not have saved it. Yeah, there it is. So if you want, here's, every time I run an analysis, it gives you the tickle file. And so this is the input, but let's look at the output. So this example here actually had a whole bunch of convergence issues. Okay. But the script actually helped it and, oh no, you see, it didn't converge. But honestly, because this was just a crappy model that I just put together to, to do a little demo, okay? 
Um, and so it wasn't, it was bound to not to converge because I don't think the structure should have been standing with the gravity loads that I gave it. Um, but if you want, now you can say, okay, well, let me go back. If it's a really problematic uh, problem, then here's your script. Uh, uh -huh, that's cool. Um, here's your APNC's input file. It's kind of cool because you can learn a lot from these input files as well. And so somewhere here, see, it's a big model. So you can go in if you want to and improve this convergence here and mm. see if you can improve it, okay? And then if you want, one is you can send it to me and say, hey, I found something that really helps it um, because if you run this file on your own, it won't, I won't post process. I need to figure out a way. I, I wanna put it that now maybe as a user, you could put in little scripts. And so if people run into this and that's a problem, I'm happy to, I, I'd love to improve this program. And uh, like your question now is like making me think, oh, I should have a user defined um, script, you know, to, to help with convergence. Um, but again, you can go in and look at this and, and put in the scripts that you want and, and modify it. At least it has helped you to generate an open seas input file. And so if you have something really complicated, it's a great place to start. Now you can add things to it and, and you can even use it this way to really just build your overall frame. And then now you can take it and run with it. You've got an open seas input file that you can do things with. Um, you know what I mean? So that, that's the way I handle it at this point. And that's why I didn't want, it's not a black box, what it has. Um, but again, I, I think it's gonna help you out a lot because you can visualize your sections and predict ahead of time um, and minimize situations where you forgot to put rebar or you defined a cross section with negative fibers when you meant to be positive. Sometimes it could be negative on purpose and that's okay. Any other questions on that? Wow, I've taken up a lot of time already. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to what I think is interesting and I would love to um, really start it as a discussion with you guys is um, this part of it. My, it's a work in progress, okay? So I've been doing GUIs and UIs and manuals since my days at UCSD. Um, I was lucky to learn structure analysis from Frieder Seibley and concrete from Nigel Priestley, um, which really built a really strong foundation. So I went into experimental, I, I did testing of beam column connections um, for my PhD. And then after that, I became the user support manager for Open Seas. I started working with Professor Fembus and I started the first Open Seas days, really wanted to, hey, I have... I'm a polyglot, English is my second language. Um, and, and so I wanted, I, I, have a, I have a gift maybe of being able to communicate with people in so many different ways. And so I saw that as extrapolating also to my work of being able to take complicated concepts and if I understand them to be able to translate them so that they're just easier to understand. Um, and, and so that's where the open seas days came into play. Uh, and then that just kind of built on there. I built the example manual, the wiki, but then I left open seas in 2010 and, and went to greener pastures and because I wanted to learn something new. And so I learned about ground motions and hazard. Um, in spring, I came back to this uh, mainly because now there was the means and there was this thing called uh, YouTube and I wanted to be a YouTube celebrity. Um, mainly because it was a means of, hey, I can actually get information out there. So I decided to start the YouTube channel and I got that going in April of this year. And I'm like, okay, but how do I, how can I make money from this? Not because I want to get rich because I am rich, um, but mainly because <laughs> I bought stocks. You want to get rich, you know, like I can... We, I can talk for two hours on stocks and, and uh, that will make you richer than this. So, um, but I wanted to make it sustainable. And so I looked into it and you know what? There's no money in YouTube for structural engineers. The more intelligent your content is, the fewer people are gonna understand it. And um, 
you know, I, I don't, I mean, to be able to get paid by YouTube, you have to have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of content in the last 12 months. I have about 880 subscribers and 600 hours. I am never going to get to 4,000 hours um, unless I go and I get sponsors and I start doing product placement. Oh, and then it doesn't even appear <laughs> uh, and things like that. And so for me, it's like, well, no, I want to focus on my technical content. I don't care. I will figure out a way. Um, you know, and, and I've got some numbers here. It's like, you can make sense to the dollar. And, you know, my kids are always sending me these TikTok videos and videos and the dumber it is, the content, the funnier it is, and the more people I have watching it. So it's like this inverse function. So I am never going to have a million followers because there's not a million people there. Not only that, but you can have a million followers. But now you have to create content every day to keep those followers watching. Um, and so I, I read this great article that just said it's very stressful. It's and even I, I, I'm a big fan of a lot of YouTube celebrities. I'm a big fan of the Kardashians and that whole business model. Um, but that's a 24 hour job. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it, it just, there were some other things that I wanted to do as well as that. And so I, I knew that YouTube was not going to go the way it was just going to be a lot of work. And it's my experience in the past, the more stuff I give away for free, the worse people treat me. Uh, this is a, an issue that's been around for a while you see it. And why do you think iPhones cost so much money? <laughs> but, and that's what gives them value is really what the cost of them is right and I love my iPhone um, as a woman honestly that was an issue uh, because people don't uh, people expect women to be more of service or doing things for you than men do and evolutionarily I'm more likely to do it just because I, I raised two kids and, and I do have more of a motherly approach so I really needed to stay away from that and so I needed to switch over to something else uh, or to a different uh, business model if I wanted to quit my day job and be able to dedicate time to this because for the last 10 years, I've been wanting to do so, but I couldn't afford it. Um, and so I switched over to, you know, the, the Sylvia Bra Sylvia's Brainery. I switched over to online courses and people screamed at me from YouTube. I got a lot of backlash uh, for doing that. But you see, there it is. Here I am trying to do something positive and doing what I can. Um, and then I get in trouble for, and, and that was hard when that transition came in, because I got a lot of negative backlash for trying to make sustainable something. It's like, well, wait a minute, I'm giving you something that saves you money and saves you time, but you want it for free so that then you can go and use it to make money. Right. I mean, we're all professionals here. We're doing this. Is, and so that was really something that you want to think about. And it's hard if you go into the service industry, <laughs> uh, which is kind of what I'm in. So it's things to think about as, as you think of, you know, that you want, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. Oh, I, I've got ideas. And they're great. I'm not trying to discourage. Uh, but the reality is a little different from that. So then I had to think about, you know, the whole business model and that. And I'm still trying to figure it all out. I think I need to go and get sponsors. But again, I don't want to go and ask. I'd rather be creating content. And so that's what I've been doing. And I've been self-financing it, uh, which means that I just take a pay cut from work and I'm putting my own time into it. It's kind of rewarding. I like it like this. It's working out pretty well. So then if you leave YouTube, and this is something I want you to think about, and then you switch over to a teaching platform, there's two different types of platforms. There's a marketplace type of platform such as Udemy. And then there's a storefront type of platform such as Thinkific, which is what I'm using and Teachable. Uh, these are two different platforms. One takes a commission, one is a fixed fee. Uh, Udemy is kind of uh, like Amazon. So, and it's exactly the same as selling your wares on Amazon versus having a physical store or an online store. If you sell on Amazon, it's great. They bring in people, go to Amazon and look for things. So they're going to bring traffic to your site. 
but they don't pay you very well. And uh, they force you to have pretty low prices. If you have your own storefront, then you get, you get to and have to design your own website, design. And what's nice about Teachable, it's got a lot of really good tools and things. I've been really happy with it, but it requires a lot of upfront and I have to bring in my own customers, right? Uh, Udemy would bring me customers, but who in the world, I mean, have you gone and typed open seas on Udemy? Um, nothing comes out. Also, not many people go on Udemy looking for open seas, right? It's pretty much a niche market. Um, so that's something to think about if you guys are going to be developing online courses, which I highly recommend. It's kind of fun. It's really neat way of learning something. And even if you just do one course, um, it, it's really, it's, it's kind of fun to do it. It's a lot of work, um, but it's a, it's a great experience and I recommend it. So, and which is why I've also built this platform that, you know, if people want to come in and have a course that you like to teach, Hey, send me a message. I'd, I'd love to evaluate it and, and see what to bring in. Uh, but even if you go on your own, think about these two different models um, and things to take into account. Uh, the concept of the name and the logo. Logo was hard to come up with. How you know? I came up with something really, really busy and crazy and stuff, and because that's just who I am. Um, and so, really coming up with something simple that you like and that people can identify with. Uh, the web portal is something else to think about. Um, I use Wix. It's a, oh, I hated it at the beginning because I didn't understand it. Um, but it actually has some really nice integration. And so then you're like, okay, well, now that I have Wix, why don't I just teach my courses on Wix? Wix actually offers you courses, offers you all these different things. And so do your homework on it and Google. I'm, I know nothing. I'm really good at looking things up. And so I learned, for example, that Wix offers you forms, but they're not as good. And so I built this really nice form about the materials. And then I looked at the results and they were all jumbled up. And so I actually use something called, not job form, uh, job form, uh, which is a company that that's all they do is to make forms. And so it actually has much better platform for you. And so these are just, you know, and how do you deal with your marketing and, and these uh, lots of different items to think about that I've had to go through the process of elimination or making mistakes. Um, so I think at this point, I know I've taken up a heck of a lot of time already, um, but I'm, I'd like to open it up to questions right now because I think that's all I have is, well, yeah, just questions, but I think um, that let's leave it at this question. You know, These are my questions for you is, uh, how can we get more content out there and how can we get people to get engaged, but also to commit and, uh, and contribute? Um, that, that's the help that I could use from you guys, but also just to kind of get a conversation started. I mean, feel free guys <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Maybe if Sylvia can start asking one question each, like, and start. Yeah. So those of you guys who are here, so for example, uh, I'll ask the question, uh, Pavan, how did how did you get started, and what got you to do what you're doing with your with the support group? So, so the thing was. Uh, when OpenSys Python started, I was the first guy who started here and I didn't have any background in Python, no coding at all. So I just started learning that stuff and started to figure out make errors and learn. And then other people started to work on that and I started helping them to get on board like multiple people. But what was going on is like, I'm just helping them to get on board. And once they are picking up, they are on their own kind of, and I'm not getting anything out of it doing that. So I thought like, okay, at least this way I will know what they're doing end to end and I'll get a chance to ask the questions and learn more. This was my intention. And once, uh, and then I talked to Max about it and Max is like, yeah, for you, it's going to be one way only. You are not going to get anything out of it. So 
I thought like mm, I should get something out of it, and I started this <laughs> kind of to learn like what others are doing. And then once I started posting, uh, then Mo also told me that there is uh, open space uh, Facebook group. Maybe you should post and forum. So I posted there. Then it was like there was good response. Uh, there are like I got almost like hundred hundred twenty people asking me to join for these groups. I mean, there are only 20 people here, but like some of them because of the time zones and other things, but they are interested in watching the videos later on. So I thought like I'll post it on YouTube. And that was my wife's idea. I just posted on YouTube. So I was like, okay, I should do that. And and it's, I mean, at least it's uh, it's there. And the other thing was once I finish and move on, my research and my experiences and my technical stuff in two, three years, I'm going to lose if I'm not working on open source. So this way, at least someone can use, then it's there with me. That was the intention. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great thing. Um, and that's what we have to do it. It's like one person at a time. Um, so I was going to ask Selena Wait, but uh, I know that is your audio connection good or not? Um, if or, you can hear us, then it's good. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. So, but she's in my uh, cafe, and I know that during the cafe we have hard. So I'm gonna pick on Christian instead. So Christian is in the Open Seas Cafe, right? Uh, which is the the group that you you pay monthly, but it's a nominal fee, and we meet once a week to talk. And so the question I have for you is, what prompted you to decide to put money into you know, these meetings. So how, how can we get people to motivate it? And I know it's hard, it's not easy, but what triggers that decision? Oh, that's a very, very good question. I'm also like in Papa's situation. So here I'm working alone. So I had to ask for help. I attended also some courses in, uh, in Italy. They had this European Open Sea Society, so, and that was quite good. But now, because of the COVID, we have to move on. So, and also the main reason is that I'm doing, uh, I'm implementing new elements in the Open Sea Library, and uh, in my opinion, this subject is not touched by anybody so far. So everybody is a user. You can find uh, material about everything, but not to implement new new elements, for example. Yeah, I'm working on Michael to develop some uh, courses on that. That would be really great to have some, the minimum amount of steps or which kind of methods to be used, uh, these kind of things. I figured it out by myself in the end, but still I'm not sure how well I did it, so. Yeah, yeah that's good. Maybe we should have a session on that. That'd be good. Okay. Anybody else have some insight as to what is, you know, how do you make the decision to step up and participate just as Pavan has done and Christian and I know I see Salama Wheat is trying to connect and I know it's hard and, and others what's keeping, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, 40 people signed up and 20 came in, uh, 20 plus the, the five over there. So that's a pretty good number. And time zone, it's killing it because that's the hard yeah. thing is in Europe is, uh, you know, Christian's about to go out to dinner at this hour. Um. <laughs> and the so. optimal time is like uh, in New Zealand, it's like 11 to 1 because in US people can attend and in Europe people can attend. And in India, it's like early in the morning, like 6 or 7. So I try to look which is like the optimal and like 11 to 1 is the window. But again, you have daylight savings and it's proof of everything. Oh, yeah. So you yeah. have to keep changing it. Yeah. I, I participate in a meeting where there's people from Japan and from Europe. And so we meet at 7 a.m. our time. Uh, yeah. But, you know, and it's late in the evening in Taiwan and this and that. So that's definitely. And that's what's nice about, you know, this being able to record these so that people can uh, just yes. at least watch a recording of it. Um, but any insight that anybody can provide in, you know, I would love, see, I need, all I have to do is get sponsors, which means I have to be nice to people and I'm not a very political person. 
uh, but how do I go to a company and say, you know, give me money for this? And, and so the way I saw it was instead of the promise, it's like, okay, here's a product, here's something, do you, you know, and hopefully now companies or somebody is going to want to come in and, and support it and, and finance it so that we can, you know, make things affordable to people because I can't keep doing it for free because I then I'd have to find a real job. Oh, yes. Can I share a thought? So yeah. since you asked that, this is not based on any like technical knowledge, but I think this makes sense. So I think, in my opinion, you do have an audience. So it depends on the goal, right? Everything depends on the goal. But you have audience, whether it's in academia, whether it is engineers that seek um, technical knowledge, um, type of model, whatever. So you have audience and it's quite large, um, whether you know or not, it's quite large. So that's in it's like this is a huge asset. So if you're just selling whatever, the main thing is you have all, like you have people to buy, right? But again, it depends on the goal, right? So you have an audience and it's quite large. Um, and then figuring out the finances. And so um, I'm an engineer. We are all engineers, but people like have the brains and the techniques to seek this. So if I were you, you definitely, within your contact um, circle, you would definitely have some people that could provide some sort of ideas or something to help with financing and stuff. But in terms of um, community engagement and stuff, you do have a quite large, uh, in my opinion, audience, whether it's students, um, people in research, people in research institutes, homes consultants are pretty like, so you do have audience. I think it's a matter of like someone, but Baban and I had some brief discussions about that, how to make things no, not, go. Not monetizing. But not mon so, so we're an academic institution and we're just trying to help each other, basically. Yeah. Like he has some more knowledge and his PY than most of us. So, so it was just helping each other. Um, but the question of getting stuff running, I think you have a lot, quite large audience and you can figure stuff out. Um, so you just need to ask the right I think, people about different stuff. I also think it's about time because right now, like most of us like are using and we are using it so we don't have to do that in buy your stuff kind of a situation. But people who are coming new, like for example, next year, who have to start and then maybe they for them it's easy to do this and learn from scratch and spend like five, six months learning that stuff and yeah. getting good at it so it's time i think my guess yeah and that's why i built the infrastructure so what i would like is it would be great is you know okay so we can't it's hard to bring in the money okay and i'm happy to have made the investment that i've made and you know i've already paid the next three years of my wix website um and i feel like the software can do it so what i would like is to have Let's distribute the work then. Uh, it'd be great if whoever's out there and you guys there to contribute to this. And, and yeah. the currency that I have for you is I have an audience. Uh, yeah. you, can, you can say, and I don't really, honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get cocky on this one, but I feel like you can put that on your resume that you have contributed to an academy uh, or to a program that you have done this work. It gives you visibility, right? I mean, I, I feel like there's a few people here that came in to to learn about this group, um, as you said, you know, my audience. And and so I feel like, hey, I have a platform. Come and, and join me. And if anybody has as you know, a, a 10 line script that is going to revolutionize, it's not about quantity, but if you've got something, you know, bring it to the table. It'd be great. And I'm I'm happy to to look at things and, and see if it's something that you know other people can benefit from, um, and I can help you to to improve it. Even I would love to do that, and so that we can we can build this community. So that's a really good point. Um, what's your friend's name, Pavan? Because uh, uh, Mo um, Mohammed. So it's Mohammed. Everybody right. calls me Mo. So oh, yeah. no. Okay, I have friend plenty of friends, Mohammed, uh, or yeah. Mohammed. <laughs> so and. It's always the A or the A or whatever it is. Anyways. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, Cynthia, like a technical kind of a question, like again, sorry to take so. you back there. So when you started like all this, uh, you could, you, I mean, you made the 
constitutive ma materials and all that stuff too, right? You might have made some of the constitutive. So what goes into that? Can you just tell us? I I'm always curious to know, like, if you want to create a new material, how do you do that? A new open seas material? And, and how do you integrate into the main thing? If you're, for example, you have concrete 02, 01, 04, and maybe I want to make one more. And how do you integrate? I mean, just curious, how do you make it? I honestly have made it a point to not get my hands into the open seas code. I haven't done it. I don't, I haven't, uh, uh, Christian will tell you. Christian knows the answer. I have stayed high level. One is, I just don't want to learn C++. I really don't. I tried. I don't oh. have, my ADHD brain cannot deal with the semantics of forgetting this or that. So the way I do it is, and it's simple, and this is my recommendation to you, is one is there are online resources. Some people have put in videos. There's some good videos on YouTube and this and that. And then get in touch with Michael Scott. And it's literally a two hour session with Michael. It's not that hard to put a material. Element is different, um, but it's, it's going to take you days to figure, like Christian said, it, it took forever to figure this out on his own. Uh, but we're trying to build resources where we can make out a knot line where you can do it. Um, so if you want to add a material, you got to get in touch with Christian okay. or um, with Michael. I really don't know the answer to that one. I mean, maybe that's, that's my or, answer. Maybe Christian or Michael, Dr. Michael can give a presentation on that. That would be good. <laughs> We could. I did. Uh, I implemented two elements so far. Oh, that's but I'm awesome. not sure like, how 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 well are they working or not. No, just the process of knowing end to end is important. Like because like you always come up. I mean, it's just for the material. There is a good example from um, from Makina, Doctor Makina, on YouTube. So it's just simple. For the material, there is an implementation, uh, step by step approach from Doctor Makina. You okay. can find it on YouTube. It's, he does a linear, I think, elastic material. Very, very simple. Okay. Cool. The, the hard with those, I believe, is the compiling the code and getting OpenSeas up and running in the code and being able to compile it. And then you pretty much, as Christian said, you follow uh, Frank's instructions and you never start from scratch. You take from an existing one. That's yeah. why it's concrete O2. There's no like concrete something else. I mean, they're all just variations and it's very frustrating, I have to say, um, variations of an, an existing script. So sometimes it's just a couple of lines. And so the hard thing, it seems to me when I took the course is the compilation and getting things up there and running. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Any other? Does anyone have any questions or want to know anything about in depth? Like, so what courses and type of courses is an interesting thing, I think. I mean, a lot of people has that because everyone is working in different areas. Like, for example, some are infrastructure interactions, so steel, concrete, and even within concrete, you have walls, columns, and all this stuff. So, like, I mean, it's hard to make a generic course, right, for all of these. Yeah. Um, well, I'm currently working on a couple of different courses. I'm working on something on NS SSI. I'm working on something on probabilistic seismic hazard analysis as well, because I think it's important as yeah. much as it's not. And I'm trying to go beyond uh, just open seas. I think there, there's a lot of things. I, I see so many people selecting ground motions and, uh, and, I, and I watched the video a couple of weeks ago of somebody teaching how to use the online portal, but they did it wrong. The person teaching it was wrong. And, and so, <laughs> they didn't fully understand it. So I feel like there's just a lot of gaps there so that 
yeah. you as a open, open seas user actually you know you're not just living in the open seas bottom bubble yeah. um so i'm uh, teaching structural dynamics right now at ucla and so i'm i'm taking notes on that course so that i could build a, a course on structural dynamics even though there's some guy on youtube that has done an amazing job so um yeah, yeah. Anything else? Nothing. And yeah, I mean, you can, do you have any suggestions for us? Like how to, I mean, what direction we should take and like how it can be more useful? Like what kind of stuff we need to work on? So, my recommendation to students is what I learned when I left. So I left um, Open Seas and went to work at Dig and Kolb Engineers. Uh, and the work that I'm doing right now with the guys at Homes is in academia, we think that we are doing the difficult problems. And in, engine, in the profession, it's all, everything is simplified, but it's actually the opposite. They are doing amazingly interesting projects, much more interesting than what we're doing in academia. And they're more challenged and they have to come up with an answer. Um, and so I, I think is, as a student, do an internship, go see what, you know, and you guys in New Zealand, I mean, the homes folks are as sophisticated in analysis as it gets. Um, and, uh, but do an internship, find out what the real problems are and interact with people, learn and also learn a lot about the US building code because uh, that's what I'm working on right now. It's like in the US and European building codes and things, it's one thing to build a model, but it's another to do it according to what the building code tells you to do. And the building code is the law and you have to meet the criteria. And so really understanding whatever models you're developing and whatever, you know, whether it's an element or it's you're looking at a, at a structure, look at how people in industry are doing these problems. Their academic problems are a lot more interesting than what we are doing in academics. Uh, it, it's interesting, I always thought it was the opposite, uh, but there's some really clever stuff that they're doing out in industry especially because they got to make do with what they have. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, all these concrete models, that's my other recommendation is there's so many different concrete models with so many parameters, but when you're looking at a building, you want to have the least number of input parameters. So maybe don't use concrete 01, maybe go to concrete 02, but stop there. You know, if you want convergence, <laughs> yeah. then use Concrete 02 or if not Concrete 01. And that's going to get, so I have this battle because I love the fact that the IMK materials, the modified Ibarra Krebinkler models, I love their degrading, but they're not as robust because the problem with a lot of these materials is they're written by a PhD student, brilliantly so, but then they had to finish and then they got a job. And so there's not enough iteration in these. And the IMK models have been through a few iterations, so they're good. Uh, but you know, so many times it's like, oh, I can't get my model to converge. I'm like, well, dump the IMK model and go to hysteretic. And then you won't have it. I tested it. It doesn't have convergence problems. Um, so don't get so caught up in the 17 little parameters of pinching four. That was developed for a very specific case of a cantilever column. And that's wonderful if you're trying to capture all the little steps, uh, or actually it was a joint or whatever it is. But my point of it is, when you're looking at a building structure, make your model as simple as possible and use the least expensive um, materials. And uh, fiber sections, only use fiber. This is my technical recommendation is, yeah. use the least number of fiber sections and only use fiber sections in elements not only will you want PM interaction, because you can model PM interaction with a uniaxial section, because you perform your analysis under that uh, axial force, 
only if your axial force varies enough in your element during the analysis do you need PM interaction, okay? And be careful to use, do not use fiber sections in your beams because that's super expensive. Uh, also, as your beam is yielding, be careful on how you're handling your constraints because you may be putting in some axial forces into your fiber section that wants to elongate, but if you're putting in a rigid diaphragm, you're not letting it elongate. So you're putting in this additional axial forces into your beam that makes it stronger. And so you think you're doing a better model, but you're actually doing a worse model because it's not realistic. Um, so those are my little experience. That's the question that I answer every time, you know, most likely it's that those are the technical hints that I can give you in building a model. Um, and then you will have your convergence problems are not going to be there so much anymore. I can't guarantee they won't be there, but it, it definitely improves your model. So, so the other thing I was uh, interested in knowing is like we have the fiber section as the most complex uh, section element we have, right? So is there something like, are we going, so I was like looking for bond slip and stuff. So like how we are, modeling the interface between the bar and uh, concrete and all that stuff. So like, uh, I mean, is there like how to do those things and all that stuff? Yeah, you can do that by going to a continuum type of model, right? Where you oh, can- three, Okay, 3D model, something. Yeah, you know, solids. And, and so, and, and then, so that's the other thing to do is, and I know a lot of people do this with Abacus, but you can do it with open seas is, Model that, do a little study of that connection, but then don't put it into your building. Then develop what we call a phenomenological model that captures all that. So this is a problem with, and it's a struggle that I'm having because fiber sections are great because they model PM interaction, but they don't capture everything else that's going on. It doesn't capture the bolt slip. It doesn't, you know, and so what people are doing with just simple, you know, uniaxial hinges is they're calibrated to the test, they're calibrated to reality, and they actually capture better. So a fiber section is not always your best section because you may be missing out other mechanisms. If you don't model your mechanism in your finite element model, you're not gonna be able to model it, right? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes just phenomenological models are better, are more robust. Um, and more accurate than a fiber section. A fiber section is not, no matter how much you wanna get into bond slip. And I did testing on these bean column joints and what was happening is my yield was penetrating all the way to the other side of the column. And so my bars that should have been in tension from bending from one side, it was actually just, I wasn't, I didn't have enough depth to anchor my rebar uh, through the joint. How do we do this with plain sections remain plain? You can't do that. You have to go to a continuum model or you do experimental tests, you do studies and you figure out how that works and then you don't model it explicitly, you model it implicitly through a phenomenological type of model that takes all that into account. So if you wanna put in bond slip, do a little study of your section and then don't go crazy with fiber sections and as this and that. Maybe it can work for a cantilever or for just a single joint. But if you wanna put it into your building, then do that as a substructure, quote unquote, do your study, develop a hinge that represents what's going on there and then put that hinge into your building. I wanted to do it for a soil structure interaction. So. Oh, awesome. I'd love to talk I mean, to you about that and, and see. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to find ways. For a cantilever column, it's like zero section at the base and then you spin score and you can capture it. But like for the soil structure interaction, should I use in the zone where it is having the peak stresses, use at each element, like I'm using displacement-based elements. So like at each end of element, should I use a zero length section or whatever? It's getting complex, but that's why I was like, is there any easier way? Because sometimes you go too complex, but there is an easy solution. 
But then do that little region, do a detailed analysis of that region to validate your springs, your cross section there, because the goal is to really look at soil structure interaction, where it's just really a flexibility. I don't care where that flexibility comes in from, whether it's from bar slip or yield penetration or something else, um, which are different mechanisms. You do a substructure, come up with a hinge, and then you put that into your overall model because it's just another flexibility component. Okay. That's, um, that's my two cents. Uh, yeah, I'm Roy, I come from China. And, hi. Uh, hi. And uh, uh, as you referred to, uh, referred to the modi uh, modified iron K model material, and I uh, also um, building, a job, uh, building a model with that material, uh, I, I, I wonder if you could uh, provide more detailed uh, recommendation for that material. And I noticed about uh, something that the uh, modified IMK material has uh, several editions in the, in the GitHub. And uh, the modified IMK in the OCS website uh, seems just the old edition. And when I deal with that material, I found uh, it seems to have some uh, convergency problem after uh, when I'm running the model. So could you give me some advice? Because uh, I found that uh, those several editions of the modified IMK have different uh, arguments. They, they're changed. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm confused. Which one is the best? It's, a, it's an interesting one. Okay. So I was talking to Frank about this the other day, actually. Okay. He said, because then at some point I was I was trying to narrow that down and I had to I got in touch so it's like the modified 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 IMK right so yeah, yeah. Um, oh Dimitrios Lignius who is now in Switzerland he's kind of like the gatekeeper I think of those so this is a Stanford thing okay uh, but anyways so Frank said that the executable and I may be wrong and that's my understanding is the executable in Open Seas does have the latest version. But they like to, I think it was Michael who's telling me about this, actually. I don't know. But um, they like to keep the code in their own repository. At the, but, and it's just so that they manage it in this. But the version, the, the latest version, because the documentation doesn't make sense in the wiki book, right? I, there was something, wait a minute, how does this parameter go? But honestly, what I learned about those materials is the only one that you care about is the deterioration. I would love to... Um, See, this is a, you should, uh, you should buy my software because I play with it. Let me see if I can, am I, I'm sharing, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 I love that material. So I'm working with Professor Filippo to put the degradation. Oh no, hold on a second. Where's open seas? Um, okay. Um, to put the degradation in straight into um, the hysteretic material because I love the hysteretic. Dump, just go to his, if you don't care about degradation, just use hysteretic. Um, but let's say it, I've got oh no material. So see, there's like a bunch, of, and then there's three of them. Why do they have three of them? I don't understand that. Okay, but I like the pinching one. Okay. <laughs> So here's the pinching material. And what I've done is I've broken down, as I was telling you in easy, is between the required properties and oh, I'm, I'm in a really poor resolution screen. Yeah. So I'm sorry that this is as small as it gets. OK. Um, so these are my default parameters on there, which all I care about is certain. I pretty much just use these values to define the envelope. And then everything else I kind of played around with until it gave me this. And so with EZs, I'm actually able to like play with these numbers to see, so it gives me what I want. The only one I care about, I've learned, is this deterioration parameter. This one, you changes just a tiny little bit, and it's really cool. I mean, it's really neat what it can do, but hold on a second. I get, I keep on, no. I have a, the controllers in my way. Okay. Um, so I'm going to copy, this is without deterioration, right? So now I'm going to test it with deterioration. Ah, oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? And so if I paste the previous values, 
just changing it to 0.042, look at how much did you, it may be even given me too much. Um, and that's why I like my program. That's the point of it. It's like, uh oh, maybe I need, and I have a test data that I'm trying to, you know, and you can copy this data and bring it over to Excel to compare it to, but maybe you just need very little uh, deterioration MC. So I, there's a million parameters on here that I don't know and I don't understand. And I just kind of play with them and I've kind of given up on them because I've figured out enough just to do this envelope. Um, but then you, you want to build like yourself a tiny little material tester. It does, you don't have to go fancy like this, but build yourself a little material tester that allows you to change these values and figure it out. And when you do, let me know. Now, um, Christian is going to give you the link in the chat for a, uh, a tool that they developed in Salerno, because these Italians are awesome. Yes, I'm Italian. Um, where you can put in your test data and uh, they give you the parameters that you need for certain open seas materials. I don't know if you guys have seen this little app that they have, it's handy. Uh, the other one is, I know Dimitris Lignos has done a lot of documentation on his own stuff on these materials. Um, and so uh, you just kind of got to play with it. So yeah, this multical.unisa.it and uh, I don't want to open it up right now because it, but it's really cool and uh, it's got information on that. So we can share that link. We can put this link in the YouTube uh, video. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but that's a great place to start. Um, but yeah, to me, these materials are a mystery. Go to Hysteretic. I love Hysteretic. I mean, look at what you could do with the Hysteretic. I mean, anything you can do there, you can do better with Hysteretic. Um, except for the degrading, but I'm working on that. But, oh, great. Oh, I hate that much here. See? Oh, I, oh and it, it's so easy to have bugs in a program. It drives me nuts. Uh, it's so hard to write a robust GUI or UI. Um, here's Hysteretic. And it it's a wonderful material, I think. It can do what... Um, IMK can do. Uh, you can play with, it's really cool because you can play with those pinching parameters. So you can actually play with, I think, I never know exactly which direction the X or the Y, the pinch X and pinch Y. Um, but you see, you can put pinching behavior. There's a lot you can do with very few materials and Professor Filippo developed this so this element material is as robust as it gets. Uh, and I'm a big fan. I, if I could do concrete with hysteretic, I would. Um, so try that. And uh, it may be good enough for what you're trying to do. I, I'm not going to take away from those materials. They're awesome. Um, but they just have way more parameters that my brain can handle. OK, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, Sylvia. Uh, just a quick question. Yes. Uh, actually, there's a lot of debate about the uh, force-based and displacement-based beam columns, you know. <laughs> so uh, what do you think is the best and what do you prefer, I mean, for your analysis? Okay, so you know my answer, right? It depends. Okay, so here's my little spiel. This is my little million-dollar course on this. And there's a lot of, I mean, you can have Michael give you a long lecture about all the background to it, okay? So here's my five cents. Um, a displacement-based element is going to give you the best answer if you have a single column so that you can put in 100 elements and you're trying to capture the propagation of plasticity along your element, okay? You're doing a single test, a simple test. You've got that one column and it really does a great propagation, right? Because you're literally doing an, an, a, a great approximation of it. So if you're doing something like that, that's where I would recommend you use the displacement beam column element. So Pavan has got one big tall column and he's really trying to capture this, you know, progression of plasticity. Yeah. Um, if you're looking, that gets expensive. It gets really expensive in a tall building or in a building or in a frame. The Force beam column element 
which is the inverse. It, you know, one is based on assumed force distributions. The other one is uh, displacement distributions and things like that. Uh, the force-based beam column element is the most efficient and effective element type. Uh, because you only need one element for that column. When Pavan needs 127 elements, I only need one. But be careful, don't use too many integration points because then you're putting in too many. Um, and I think Michael Scott wrote a, a blog about this actually. But um, so, you know, a force-based uh, force beam column element with three integration points is going to get you very far for a long time. Now, at some point, I had done some work and then they implemented that in the beam with hinges. The beam with hinges, what it does is it, oh yeah. So, and then the force beam column element in the old days, you had only one cross section across the entire element. So that was a problem. Well, that's out the window. Now you can assign a cross section at every integration point. Um, and the beam with hinges is kind of what triggered that where you had inelastic distributed plasticity at the ends and the hinges and then elastic section in the middle. Well, what Michael Scott, and so that was his first iteration of that, um, which was great. And then he did an improvement on that. And I call that the distributed hinge element because it's not a whole distributed plasticity. But then he went in and he changed the force beam column element to do that and more. And it's got like a million different um, whatever it's called, uh, formulations and ways of integrations and you can control it, you can do. So I, I figured out a way of doing a lump plasticity element using the force beam column element just by playing with plastic hinge lengths and weights. Um, so to me, it's the most versatile, um, but you gotta be careful with softening. Michael's latest blog about, uh, you know, softening or things like that, it's an issue. You but issues with that, right? Convergence issues too with the first uh, No, a lot less than, it, it, again, it's because you're using the IMK materials. It's not the element itself that has the convergence issues. It's actually very robust unless you've got the, what is that localization? So it's not super accurate if you're trying to get your plastic hinge strains or your strains in your fibers. Then it depends on, you gotta look at the work that people have done on localization and things. But to me, it's like, wait a minute, we're looking at overall response. You can't, you can't win both ways. Um, but if you look at the documentation for uh, nonlinear, so it's a force-based beam column, open seas wiki, okay? And you go here. Then you go to the very bottom of it. It's just like this tiny little secret place um, I showed this to uh, Christian the other day. So you see how it says integration types? You click on that, and then you're not even there yet. You got to click on this PDF file. And Michael said he's going to write an update to this. So this is the real documentation for the force beam column element that has a bunch of different integration schemes. Um, so the issue with the convergence with the beam column element is I think it's more about your sections. Um, and yeah, it's not going to be as quote unquote robust as your 127, L, you know, displacement based elements. But if you're doing a building, you can't quite do that. Someday we will when we have enough computational abilities and things like that. Um, but what I would do is I would, I would recommend doing the uh, distributed plasticity element, but understanding what the different integrations are and seeing what you're doing, or just go with the beam with hinges because he's done all the defaults for you. Um, and it's, it's a really nice element. And the beam with hinges is the one that solves that problem of instability uh, as an element. So, but there's a whole school about all these different types of integrations. So that's my high level non-computational person description of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, where are you calling from? Uh, yeah, I'm from Auckland too. <laughs> Yeah, oh. I'm but yeah, I, I'm just in a different place there, so yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And you want to talk about your workshops that you're going to organize in Oh, yeah. So I'm, uh, 
I have to get all this stuff done by December. Um, but uh, Michael Scott and I are organizing Open Seas Days World. No, global was the was the term. So we're gonna we're trying to figure it out. And so maybe this is the feedback I want. If if I have to, I would love to do this for free. But if I do this for free, I can't. Um, I can't take four days off and, and do this. I mean, there's a lot for every hour of workshop, there's three hours of preparation time. Um, and so if anybody wants to go and find a sponsor or find somebody to, to do this, then we could do it for free. But I don't know what to do because if I do it for free, then I'll do a two hour workshop. If people pay, I'm happy to do a three hour workshop because if there's a hundred people that come and it, you know what I mean? So I don't know what to do with that. I, I, that's the feedback I would love from you guys, but we are going to do it. We'll figure it out uh, what we're going to do. And Pavan and I were talking about maybe doing something hybrid in, in a mix. Um, yeah. But so we're thinking of doing like a second hands on session here and just give an overview and I'll show some demonstration of how to go end to end for like, but not in one session, it will be like one hour sessions, multiple like four or five sessions, like bi-weekly because, I mean, honestly, the other thing is like after a few days, you run out of presenters, I can't, I mean, I'm also doing my PhD, so I have to keep finding exactly. people. So it's easier if people are coming forward to help, there is a platform. I want to present, that would be easier too for us. Like, okay, bro, like you have a slot here, some like and all that stuff that way mm -hmm. we can do continue this for longer and when i go someone else can take over our own different. yeah maybe christian could come and talk about his element and his implementation yeah uh, i mean anything it can be like yeah. if you did some work good amount of work just like because that's just like you're that way you can get inputs of other people also like what you're doing and like it's also good to other people like yeah so that's what i'm thinking of one of the sessions of having people and that's how i had done open seas days that we would do a user workshop and then every other year we would either do a developer workshop which is really hands-on and how to develop things and then one is just a user of different people talking about the different things that they've done with open seas and what we learned from it so that's what we're trying to figure out in planning but i have to get my day job done before I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. I mean, All right, guys. I have to go and uh, my daughter had her wisdom tooth removed today and I missed it. So I got to wow. go. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. Oh, this Thank was um, so those of you guys who are new to this group, so make sure you subscribe. I think we're going to put <laughs> subscribe to not just my channel, which of course you, you better be by now. I'm kidding. Um, but also to Pavan's and, and, you know, if you guys are happy to contribute to what he's doing, he's, you know, down in the, okay. in the trenches and he's no clue, but he's actually, you know, doing a bit more work. So anything that anybody wants to contribute or be part of, you know, you want to present at uh, the at Open Seas Days, it'd be great. Even if you have an open topic, I mean, what the heck? You yeah. know, say, hey, here's my research project. Yep. Anybody have uh, some insight? And and so um, I'm, I'm guessing mine was a different approach, but only because I'm 50 years old. Um, so. I mean, if you're just starting and you have your project and you want to start modeling, you can just keep click as an open discussion tool. That's fun to, to do. Yeah. Very okay. Thank you, Sylvia, for the presentation. Thank you, guys. It was, All right. it was really helpful and just a point. Like when I approached Sylvia, it was so easy to approach. I was like initially, man, like another big person, like with big name, like might shut down my email or stuff because that's what happens, right? Usually, you cold call. I I didn't know you before, and I cold call you, like send you a text. Yeah out of the blue and like you replied nicely and thank you for that too. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm always happy to learn. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a people. I'm, I don't have a real title and I don't have a real job soon. I won't either. <laughs> so, all right, guys, thank you so much. I've learned a lot from you. I appreciated all the feedback.
And I, I really like Mohammed's idea of, uh, I, I, I need to get more people to, uh, to help. And, and I'm happy to have that. So I'm going to give you a call, Mohammed, and you're going to do my marketing, OK? OK. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and knowledge. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, and thank you, thank Pavan, you. for organizing this. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you so much.